I've heard of silent prayer requests before, but never silent announcements. I like that. <laughs> should have more of those. <laughs> Good morning. I knew better than to set my water up here because I knew every musician in the place would just, <laughs> and I'd lose everybody. <clears throat> so I stole a stool. <clears throat> well, this is my first time to be able to uh, share with you since we've been teaching in the book of Acts. And I, I love the book of Acts. I love the book of Acts. I love to read it. I especially love to read it when I'm going on mission trips of various sorts to various places around the world. Some of you may, may know, uh, probably most of you don't know, that I serve as uh, one of the directors of a small network of independent charismatic churches in central Indiana. Uh, it's called RENET, actually formally affiliated. Because they were, all these churches, there are not that many of them, half a dozen or so were basically not affiliated to anybody. They didn't have any denominational ties. And for the sake of mutual accountability and uh, being able to do more together than we could do alone, we decided a number of years ago that we'd actually kind of formalize our relationship. But prior to that, we've been working together for probably most of the last 30 or 40 years, uh, the pastors of these churches. So we have some churches, a couple of churches in Anderson. Used to have three back when we had a church. <laughs> so much for that. Uh, uh, one in Chesterfield, down in Knightstown, over in Westfield, Rushfield, just scattered around here and there in central Indiana. And uh, it's been a real good group of brothers that I've known since the early 70s. And uh, they've uh, been a great strength and encouragement to, to me personally. And we've been able to, you know, put on conferences together and do mission projects together and so forth and so on. Many of the same things that denominational groups do, uh, we've, we've been able to do. So in the early 90s, the Lord opened up a door for us to do some evangelizing and church planting uh, in the major cities along the Volga River in Russia. Uh, if you're not familiar with Russia, the Volga River uh, runs pretty much north to south uh, about a third of the way across Russia, and it's a river like the Mississippi. Only, if you could say the Mississippi is important for commerce in America, then the Volga River is more so in Russia. It's just, it's, it's called the Mother River of Russia. And uh, we had an opportunity, I don't have time to tell you the story how we actually first got there, but we were working in, uh, beginning in 1993, in some of the major cities along that river. And uh, the cities range from Astrakhan in the south, which is just near where the river empties into the Caspian Sea. It's about three quarters of a million people. Uh, to cities like Volgograd, uh, Saratov, Samara. Uh, cities of anywhere from one to two or more million people. So they're, they're not small burgs. And the Lord had given us the opportunity to begin working in some of those places and actually Samara had um, sort of become our center point base of operations. It's about 650 miles from Moscow on the Volga River, southeast of Moscow. So on one of those, and uh, we were taking groups from our churches here and then from uh, another network of churches o over in Ohio that we were affiliated with, uh, groups of folks to do church planting crusades and evangelism one point we took, uh, Carol and I had two sons, both of which are musicians, and they had a band in those days and um, sang and did things around the area, Christian music of one sort or another. And so we, we took their band to Russia you, uh, in the mid-90s. You, you had no idea. You would have thought they were the Beatles or the Stones or somebody. The way the Russian young people uh, ate up, you know, anything coming from America, anybody that spoke English for that matter was just, you know, greatly appreciated and loved. And so uh, we were able in those days to uh, take their band into Russian public schools and uh, do music and preach the gospel and give altar calls 
and have kids respond to altar calls in Russian public schools. We couldn't do that in America at the time, nor of course even yet, but we could do that in Russia. And one of the things we did, there, there are lots of stories that came out of that, but over the course of about eight to 10 years, I had the privilege of leading about 20 different teams to do various things in various cities in Russia. And one of the things that we did a lot of in those days, and it was easier to do it then than it is now, is we did a lot of preaching on the streets. We'd go out and find a marketplace. Open air markets were fairly common in uh, the areas of Russia we were working in. And uh, we'd, uh, we'd just preach in the market. And people would respond. And an amazing thing would happen. We, we took gospel tracts in Russian that we had gotten from a place up in New Paris, Indiana. We, we took cases of these things, cases of Bibles. And um, we'd start handing out tracts in the marketplace. And unlike in America, where if you hand out a tract, you're soon going to see it on the ground, <laughs> you know, at the next street corner or in a trash can or whatever. The Russian people would come to us and beg us, literally beg us, to give them more copies of the track that they could take back to their apartment buildings and to their neighbors and to their friends and their family. And um, one night after a crusade meeting in a, like it's called a Doma Cultura, which is a house of culture, kind of like a community building where they have all kinds of events. And that's where we held most of our evening meetings. Um, after one of the nights, we'd, we had some cases of Bibles with us. And so a pastor that we were working with had warned us, don't, don't open up those Bibles, the, the, those cases, just like right out here, because it'll, there'll be a riot. There'll be a riot to get those Bibles. And so we found a stairwell in the building and kind of barricaded ourselves in the stairwell where people would only have access to us from the front. They couldn't get around behind us, you know, press in on us and so forth. And we, we gave away some Bibles and we literally started a riot. It was incredible how many people were pushing and shoving uh, to get a copy of the Bible in their hands. One of the things the Russian believers who had all been a part of the underground church, I, I didn't, when I... When I was preparing to share today, I didn't realize the emphasis was going to be on uh, the persecuted church today. So uh, I'm really blessed to, to see that that's happening. But um, one of the, some of the Russian believers had told us, one of the things you don't do in Russia is you don't put a Bible on the floor or on the ground. Because they considered the Bible such a sacred book that that was... That was sullying the Bible to put it down on the floor. Now, we, we treat Bibles fairly haphazardly in America, and they're so easy to come by that now you just put them on your electronic devices and don't even have to carry a real Bible anymore. But in Russia, especially in those days, Bibles were treasures, just like in this video that we just saw. So... Uh, and, and there's so many of these stories that are like this, but one particular uh, morning, we took a group of folks, 10 or 15 of us, and went out to a market, and opened our mar market. It was, it was probably in the fall, because I remember it was chilly. And um, so we had some musicians with us, and they, you know, immediately, as soon as we got to the market, I mean, this was all real you know, just play it by ear, haphazard, nothing really organized. Musicians would just kind of break out their instruments and start singing, and in no time, a crowd would gather. And when a crowd would gather, they'd stop singing, and one of us would preach, <laughs> you know, and uh, it, was, it was a great gimmick. <laughs> it was really, it was really wonderful. And uh, I'd done some street preaching in America back in the 70s where it wasn't so difficult to do, but lately around here it hadn't been so easy. So anyway, in this particular morning, the musicians sat up and they began to sing. And I'm standing back behind them with a couple of interpreters that we had, friends of ours, when um, 
an elderly gentleman came up to me and began speaking to me in Russian. Of course, I didn't understand a bit of it, though he was uh, very animated in his Russian, and he was clearly asking me a question, which I didn't know, didn't understand. And so while the musicians were continuing to sing, I got one of our interpreters and said, please tell me what this gentleman's asking. And so she interpreted, and here's what he was saying. He said, sir, what have you been drinking? I said, what? What have you been drinking? And I thought, I heard that, that question somewhere before. Remember where that is? We just read it a couple of weeks ago, the book of Acts. And what was happening was our musicians were just full of joy. They were just beaming with the love of Jesus. In Russia in those days, nobody had any joy. In fact, nobody would look you in the eyes as you were walking down the street. Everybody walked with their head down in what looked to me like a drug-induced stupor. That's just how oppressive was the atmosphere in Russia in those days. And by contrast, here were our musicians up there. The joy of the Lord is my... You know, and uh, this guy was just freaking out. And so he wanted to know, basically, if we'd been drinking what he'd been drinking. And I was able to say, sir, that's a very biblical question you just asked. And I got the opportunity then to share the gospel with him, to tell him about Jesus, and to tell him why we had so much joy and hope in our lives. He didn't respond that morning that I'm aware of the gospel, but lots of other folks did in that little market area where we preached. And that was such a typical time in the early to mid-90s in Russia that it was amazing. After we'd had these outdoor meetings, then we'd invite, we'd pass out usually just tracks on the street. We, we didn't get Bibles out on the street usually. But then we'd invite people to come to the culture house, house of culture that night for our meetings, and many would come. Hundreds and probably would be fair to say thousands of people gave their lives to the Lord. Churches got planted that several of them are there to this day. So, in fact, um, we just had a team in Russia last week. I wasn't on it, but and uh, we're making plans to go do some church planting next summer in a, a region in the southeastern part of, no, sorry, southwestern part of Russia. There's a province known as Kalmukia. I never heard of this until a year or two ago, which is a Mongolian Buddhist. And it's, it's all the way across the nation. And by the way, a, a Russia is 11 time zones wide. Do you think daylight savings time is rough here? I live in Russia. <laughs> but this province is completely Mongolian Buddhist. And uh, it's one of the unreached people groups in Russia. And so we're, we just sent an exploratory team there this summer. And we're going to be going back next year, some of us, to do some church planting in that particular province. And we're really excited about that. So, as we get into our text this morning, let me just remind you of two primary events that took place late in the Gospels, in Luke, since we just came from Luke, and early in the book of Acts, without which we wouldn't have had a book of Acts. There are two extremely crucial events. One is the resurrection of Jesus. How many you know without the resurrection of Jesus, it's finished? It's over. It's done. Peter and the boys were going back fishing, and everybody else was going back to what they did before they met Jesus. Because this, was, this deal was done when they laid him in the tomb. Except for one thing. <laughs> he got up out of the tomb, and he was alive, and he appeared to, the scripture says, as many as 500 people at one time. 
They saw him alive. And nothing made more difference in the lives of these early disciples than the resurrection of Jesus did. So that was an event that took place just prior to the book of Acts. And then, as you'll recall, early in the book of Acts, we talk about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that took place at Pentecost. I would suggest to you that without these two events, we wouldn't have the book of Acts, we wouldn't have the early church, we wouldn't have the Bible at all, and we wouldn't have Christianity at all. This little Jewish sect would have died out and been forgotten to history had there not been a resurrection and had there not been an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was the power that came to them to change them inwardly and anoint them outwardly to be and to do the work of Jesus in the earth. When Peter starts out in the book of Acts, he says, the first treatise that I gave you was about the things Jesus began to do and teach. You could easily assume, though it doesn't say explicitly in the text, that the book of Acts is the things that Jesus continued to do and teach by his Holy Spirit in the midst of his church. In fact, in some ways, I think the book of Acts, which is technically called the Acts of the Apostles, might better have been called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. Because it was the Holy Spirit doing the acting. The Apostles were just along for the ride. Amen? So, we pick up in Acts 4, verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They were disturbed, the powers that be, the church leaders, the the Jewish leaders, were disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. And many of those who had heard the message believed. And the number of men came to be about 5,000. So if this had been a typical American scenario, there would have been not quite 20,000 believers because for every man there would have been a wife and there would have been 1.8 children. You know, that 0.8 child was a problem child. But probably in Jewish lands in those days, they had more than two kids per family, so this could have been 30 or 40,000 people that were members of the church in those days. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest was there, and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. Instead of trying to figure out who all these people are, can we just say these are the powers that be? These are the leaders of the Jewish people in those days. And when they placed them in the center, Peter and John, and this is over them healing the lame man at the temple gate in the chapter before, they begin to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, as opposed to Peter cowering away and denying Jesus three times. That's the same Peter. Only difference, outpouring of the Holy Spirit and resurrection of Jesus. Only difference. Same Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to speak to them. He says, rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, a benefit for crying out loud, done to a sick man, As to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified. Wow, that's bold for Peter. You know, he was looking the same people that he was cowering from just weeks before, looking them in the eye and saying, you crucified him whom you crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And by the way, that's a quote out of both Isaiah and or Psalms. Those, that term is used in both those places. The stone which the builders rejected. He's become the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name among heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. I'm happy to stand before you today as someone who believes that there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Religion won't save us. Christianity won't save us. Certainly Buddha won't save us and Confucius won't save us and Mohammed won't save us. But the name of Jesus in his name, you and I can be saved. And I can testify to the fact that when Jesus came into my life, he revolutionized my life, turned it upside down. Now, turned it right side up and has made all the difference in me. I don't have anything else good to share the world. I don't know about you. I just don't have anything else to share because Jesus, and I love the name Jesus. Don't you love the name Jesus? A lot of times we talk about the Lord and we talk about God. No, I'm good with God, okay? I like him. But you know, if you don't personalize God and if you don't realize God revealed himself, God the Father revealed himself in the form and through the name of his son, Jesus, then you haven't quite gotten as far as you need to get in your relationship with the Father because the Father wants us to know the Son and to know him by his name, Jesus. It's at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Hallelujah. I don't believe in that day that every knee that bows will do so willingly. But I believe every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I've already mentioned the resurrection of Jesus. I just want to because I'm only going to get to share, you know, just once every while in the book of Acts, and so I won't be teaching the whole book of Acts, but I want us to just kind of get a little glimpse at the message in the book of Acts. And I trust I'm not stealing what anybody else will share with you. And if I am, consider it well stolen. Because <laughs> it's everywhere in the book of Acts, this thing about the resurrection of Jesus. It was their central theme and message from the day they discovered him to be alive. They pretty much didn't preach about much else. They mentioned the kingdom occasionally, but the kingdom came in the form of the person of Jesus who was raised from the dead. Wouldn't you talk about that if you ran into him somewhere? If he had been dead and your dreams had been shattered and you were disillusioned and you were disgusted and you were downhearted and you were through with it all and you were going back to your old way of life. And one day Jesus walks through the wall and says, Hi guys, I'm back. Isn't that what you'd talk about for the rest of your life? That's what they talked about for the rest of their lives. I'll give you a few examples. Acts 3, 14. And I'm not going to take the time to put these in context. Read the book of Acts. There's your context. Acts 3, 14. <laughs> but you disown the holy and righteous one and ask for a murderer to be granted to you. But put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Acts 4, this is a verse that we... We just read. 
being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 4.10. I don't think we've actually gotten to that verse yet. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands before you in good health. Acts 4.32. Not in the section we're covering today in the last part of this chapter. But it's the message. Verse 33. With great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. This has been a most unusual year for me in preaching. This is the third time this year I've gotten to tell you guys about the resurrection of Jesus. And it can't happen often enough as far as I'm concerned. Because this is the message. Acts 5.30. God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. Acts 10, 40. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he became visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Acts 13, verse 34. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead no longer to return to decay. In verse 37, but he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Acts 17, verse 18, this is Paul in Athens. Also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Acts 17, 31. Paul speaking on Mars Hill. Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again concerning this. Acts 23, verse 6. I am on trial, Paul being you know, tried for his faith. He says, I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. 24.15, and there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Verse 20, 21. Other than for this one statement, which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. And Acts 26.23, that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light, both to the Jews, Jewish people and to the Gentiles. One of the things that criminologists tell us, you, you can see that was the message, the central message of the early disciples in the early church. One of the things that criminologists tell us is that often uh, people just before they die, convicts and the like, want to clear their conscience of the lies they may have told or schemes they may have committed or whatever just before they die knowing they're, they're about to go off into eternity. One of the things that um, folks who study these things say is that it's important to note that of all the early disciples, of all the original 12 minus Judas plus Paul, <clears throat> They all died a martyr's death, except for John, who tradition says was boiled in oil to kill him, but it didn't kill him. And he ended up dying a natural death. Everybody else died a martyr's death, never once denying the resurrection of Jesus to get out of the fate that awaited them. That's pretty good testimony that these were, in fact, true things. Back to our text in verse 13. In spite of the fact that the clock, the clock moved backward an hour last night, it's moving forward awful quickly this morning. Verse 13. Now they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. I want to point out one other thing, and this is scattered throughout the book of Acts. Um, but it's something I noticed some time ago. 
that I think is important for us to, to take note of. And that is there was an amazement factor in the life of the early church. And I believe that amazement factor had to do with the Holy Spirit. Or as some of my more Pentecostal pastor friends would say, Holy Ghost. It was the Holy Ghost that did it. There was an amazement factor in the early church that I'm afraid sometimes we don't see as much in the world today. Let me just read you some verses. I just read that when they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. In Acts 2, 6, when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were be bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all those who are speaking Galileans? Acts 3.11. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. So when Peter saw this, he replied to the men, to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why do you gaze at us as if by our own power of piety we had made him walk? 4.13. Now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John, understood they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed at this room. 8.11. Even Simon, the sorcerer, himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and as he observed, observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. 9.20. Now for several days, this is Paul, he was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed. 1044, Peter at Cornelius' house. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door, they saw him and were amazed. That's when Peter got out of, let out of prison. Acts 13, verse 12. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So there's an amazement factor in the early church. Can I tell you, I believe that's the calling card of the early church. People looked on their lives and they were astonished. They were bewildered. They were amazed. And I believe it's because the Holy Spirit rested upon them and was doing all kinds of mighty things. Remember when Jesus had his discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and he talked about, you know, you must be born again and unless a man enters into his... Uh, mother's womb, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then he talks about the Holy Spirit. And he says um, that the Holy Spirit blows where it will. You don't know where it's going to go now. You know, but you see the effect of it in the wind. I think sometimes our version of the Holy Spirit is too controlled. You know what I mean? We, we really love the Holy Spirit as long as he stays in his place. But woe be unto the Holy Spirit if he should get a little out of line and we should have to have things decently and in order. I know I'm stirring the pot. But one of the things that happened in the early church is folks were amazed when they saw what the Holy Spirit was doing in their midst. And it was their advertisement. It drew people. And then they were able to introduce them to Jesus. Verse 14. Seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in reply. But when they ordered them to leave the council, they began to confer with one another, saying, What shall we do to these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle, that always makes me laugh. <clears throat> it wouldn't be enough that would be an average, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, everyday miracle. that took place. This one was noteworthy. Well, you'd be amazed too if that kind of stuff was happening all around you, wouldn't you? As would I. The fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem we cannot deny it. The powers that be couldn't figure out what to do with these guys because the problem is this thing had gotten out of hand. And they were trying to stuff it back in the bottle. But 
noteworthy miracles were going on. And people were being drawn to that. The disciples were preaching about Jesus and his resurrection. Folks were getting saved. Thousands were being added to the church. We've got to get this thing back in the bottle. And they couldn't. So they're trying to figure out, well, how do we contain this? How do we control this? So that not spread any further among the people, let us warn them to speak no longer to any man in this name. And when they summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Yeah, right. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God, give heed to you rather than to God. You be the judge. Well, we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. You know, he was dead. Now he's alive. We're going to talk about that no matter what you do to us. We're going to talk about it. And they did talk about it till the day they died. So they let them go, finding no basis on which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old and this miracle of healing had been performed. In 1989, I had the opportunity to take a group of people from my church to Hong Kong. I'd been wanting for some time to make it to Hong Kong before the Hong Kong uh, territory was being turned back over to the Chinese. I don't know, so, some of you young people, as far as you know, Hong Kong's always been you know, under the rule of Chinese, but for most of us that are over 30, the British had a 99-year lease on Hong Kong. Can you believe that? That one country could actually lease a part of another country? They, they wanted as a result of some treaties uh, at the end of some wars, okay? I mean, Chinese didn't just say, well, we'd like to rent you Hong Kong. You know, there was a big war. To settle, in settlement of the war, they gave them 99 year lease to Hong Kong. So in uh, late 1997, the British were supposed to, the lease was up, and they were going to turn the other thing back over to China. If you went to Hong Kong before that, it was a British colony, okay? Uh, if you went to Hong Kong after that, it was Chinese colony. So anyway, I had a desire for some time, since the Lord had been allowing me to go places, to make it to Hong Kong before it got turned back over to the Chinese to see if we could make some contact with some Christians there in Hong Kong that were doing some good work so that after um, you know, it reverted to Chinese control that we'd have some point of contact and so forth and so on. So I'm not gonna tell you all the details, but anyway, I made some arrangements and a group of people, 11 of us, went from Alathia in Anderson Hong Kong for a two-week trip. And most of that two-week trip, we, were, we stayed at a YWAM base, and we worked with the YWAMers, and um, they were heavily involved in ministering to Vietnamese refugees in some refugee camps, because after the Vietnam War, a lot of refugees left Vietnam and headed to Hong Kong, and they were, they were actually living in buildings larger than this building, living in steel cages, stacked five or six high, like cages that were this big of a cube, stacked up to the ceiling. No doors, no locks or anything, they weren't locked. But that was their entire quarters. An entire family would live in one of those cubicles. And there were hundreds, probably thousands of them living in these places. And we worked with YWAM just helping you know, pass out food and clothes and sharing the gospel and so forth with them for most of that two weeks. But the last two days, the last couple of days of our trip, we had, um, we had some people on our team who wanted to carry Bibles into China. I was not one of them, but I was their leader. And so I had made some arrangements. The thought, to be perfectly honest with you, of walking across a communist border crossing facing communist guards with AK-47 rifles when I have a bullet in my hand from an AK-47 rifle from Vietnam, that thought just didn't make my day. 
especially knowing we'd be carrying bags of illegal Bibles when we crossed the border. But I had people that were gung-ho for Jesus on my team. And they thought it wouldn't be anything better than carrying some Bibles into China while we were there. I can't tell you how I wrestled with that thought. And finally, uh, some of the team didn't want to go, and I would have been happy to have been their leader. But unfortunately, most of them did, and so those are my people. I must, must catch up to them. So I'd made arrangements with a church. I won't tell you what church, because as far as I know, they're still carrying Bibles in the mainland China. That we would work with them for a couple of days on our, the last couple of days of our being there. And so we had uh, an orientation meeting with them. And in this orientation meeting, they told us the do's and don'ts of carrying Bibles into China. And they said, now when you come up to the customs, the border crossing, uh, separate out in the crowd and don't, don't hang with each other. Stay at least five minutes apart from each other because that way if they catch one of you, they won't catch all of you. And so at least some of you will get through. And so, okay, sounds good. So they divided our group into two teams and they gave us a leader from this church to go with each team, uh, an experienced leader, someone who had carried Bibles into China many times before. And so we headed out. Well, I had one elderly gentleman who happened to get in my group who just, no matter what I would do, wouldn't let me get five minutes away from him. Yeah, yeah. I'd wait for him to be in front of me as far away as I could get from him. And he'd wait on me. And he'd talk to me. And then I'd try to hurry up and get away from him, and he'd hurry up with me. And it just, it just was not going to work. Well, you guessed it. He got caught, and I got caught. And they took away our Bibles. And we had duffel bags of Bibles and trench coats with pockets full of Bibles and other Christian literature. And they took them all. And they told us in our orientation, if you do get caught and they do start to take all your stuff, ask them if you can at least take one of each kind of literature for your own personal use with you. So I asked the border guard. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, next time they, he took all my Bibles. And he gave me a receipt for the Bibles. And they let us go on into China. And that day, my group, my half of our group, uh, almost every one of them got caught and all their Bibles got taken. Fortunately, the other team that went through a different border crossing made it through with all their Bibles. So we we barely just got inside China and, you know, kind of gathered up with the group and turned around and came back out. And when we crossed the border going back into Hong Kong, we turned in our receipt, and they gave us back our bags of Bibles. Oh, this is not so bad. So, but anyway, it was humiliating. I'm the leader, and I got caught. And I didn't want to do this to start with. What kind of joke is this, Lord? So we were scheduled to go back into China the next day. And I had an awful time with that. That night, I just, if you can imagine every misgiving, every second thought, every excuse, I was pretty much up all night wrestling this out with the Lord and saying, Lord, I don't want to do this. I didn't have fun yesterday. I'm not looking for it to be fun today. And I don't want to go. And in the end, I decided to go because I didn't want to look like a coward in front of the rest of my team. Now, I really bared my soul here today. That's the truth. I just didn't want to be thought of as a coward. So we went. Well, we were supposed to go through a different border crossing the next day so that we would not be 
recognized by the same born of cards. <laughs> I thought that was a great idea. Except for, we didn't. They assigned us to go through the very smack dab same border crossing we went through the day before. It was a very uneasy ride for me on the train up to the border. Very, very uneasy. But you know what? Every one of us, both groups, made it through the border that day with all our Bibles intact. And we had, I mean literally, hundreds. Each of us was carrying two duffel bags of Bibles. I don't know how on earth, but we all made it through. And so once we were inside China, we went through a different border crossing, the same one as the day before, but a different one than our other team. Um, we took a two-hour train ride to the city of Guangzhou, China. And we were, it was planned for us to spend the night in a hotel called the White Swan Hotel. And I Googled this yesterday. You can Google it when you get home. It's still there. The White Swan Hotel in Guangzhou, China. About two hours from the board. And when we got to the hotel, we were reunited with our other team. And we turned our Bibles into a safe room in the hotel. And they got locked up. And once that was done, we were, we were finished. Our job was over. And we were just, from that moment on, we were tourists. And we were going to spend the night. This is a very famous hotel on the Pearl River, a very famous river in China. So we were just free to spend the night, you know, as tourists. So we decided, after a while, we'd go out for a walk in the market. Open-air market. If you've never been to an open-air Chinese market, it's a real treat for the senses. Every imaginable kind of animal for sale for food. Creepy crawly things of every dimension. You just can hardly imagine it. So anyway, we walked through the market. And on our way back to our hotel, uh, a couple of members of our group, a couple, saw a young man sitting on a park bench reading a book. And it looked, looked like one of the same kind of books that we had just carried in and left at the hotel. We knew it wasn't one of ours, but our, our Bibles didn't say Holy Bible on the outside. They were plain colored, you know, uh, uh, plain covers, but multicolored, with reds and blues and yellows and all that kind of stuff. So this guy was sitting there reading one. So some members of our group went up to him and asked him in English what he was reading. And he said he was reading the Bible. And so they struck up a little conversation. He spoke a little English. He told them he was an English teacher. But he didn't speak much English. But he told them he was a Christian. Now, as far as he knew, we were tourists. And they didn't tell him anything different because we didn't want to jeopardize what we had been doing. And so in a fairly short conversation, the young man said, uh, there's an underground church meeting going on tonight. I'd like to invite you guys to come to it. Now, get in your mind. He thought we were just tourists, as far as we knew. And so, our two group leaders from this church in Hong Kong had a big discussion over this because they were in disagreement. One of them said, you know, we can't afford to go to this meeting because um, we, might, we might jeopardize this underground church by our presence. You know, we might expose them in some way. Or we might expose the ministry that we're working with and, you know, cause things bad to happen to this Bible courier ministry. And so they had a big argument. The other uh, group leader was arguing, no, no. You know, in all these years of us carrying Bibles into China, we have never been invited to an underground church meeting. We can't pass up this opportunity. And so they never did come to an agreement. So finally they just said, well, you do what you want and I'll do what I want. Okay, well, it sounded, I guess, I don't know what that sounded like. But. So the one that wanted to go to the meeting says to the rest of our team, does anybody want to go with us? Well, of course, some of us wanted to go. And uh, so we actually divided up, and some of our group decided to stay at the hotel that night, and others said we would go to the underground church. So 
um, one final caution. They said, let's have this young man go back and speak to his pastor and ask the pastor if it's okay if we come to the meeting or not, because the pastor will know whether or not we're endangering him in any way. And so it was agreed that he would do that. And so this young man says, I'll be back after supper. And so honestly, I thought, well, that's, that's the end of that. You know, we'll never see this young man again. And he showed up right after supper at our hotel. And he said, Pastor wants you to come. Okay. Now, we don't know this guy. For all we know, he could have been the Chinese version of the KGB. You know, we don't know him. But a bunch of us piled into two taxis and headed out across town with this guy. And I happened to get in a taxi that there was no English speaker in the taxi. And so I didn't have anybody to talk to. And we, we drove for, I don't know, probably an hour or two. Across town, through the nice parts of town, through the seedy sections of town, where tourists don't go. And I was getting really nervous because I'm thinking, you know, where is this guy taking us? What police station are we going to be interrogated at? And so then we got, we finally, we get taxi stops at a kind of a wide alleyway to a side street kind of thing. And we get out and we go walking down this alley and we come to a, like a three-story building and there's a plaque on the wall of this building and it says in Chinese, I don't know what it said in Chinese, but I'll tell you what it said in English. It was written in both Chinese and English. It said in English, the meetings being conducted in this building are illegal. A bird just tried to make an entrance. Are illegal, and anyone attending them is subject to arrest. Well, how do you do? I had no idea that, at least in some places in China, the underground church was not secret. It was just illegal. So we go trudging up these stairs to the third floor, and on the way up the stairwell, an elderly gentleman standing on the landing, and he's shaking all of our hands. And he says to us as we go by, he says, after the meeting, says this in English, Chinese elderly gentleman, after the meeting, we will have fellowship. Cool. I'm for that. So we get in the meeting, and it's a youth meeting. And there's maybe 50, 75, maybe 100 people. It was a fairly good size upper room. And it's being conducted by young people. And they're hooping and hollering and singing and shouting and testifying and preaching. And if it had been secret, the neighbors would have all known about it and everybody passing by on the street because you could hear it everywhere. And I'm sitting there thinking, my God, what is going on? The meeting goes on without a hitch. At the end of the meeting, this gentleman, who's the pastor, pulled out a table, dragged the Americans up around it. Again, they just think we're tourists, as far as I know. And he begins to tell us his story. In those days, I was carrying one of those big video cameras, you, you know, um, like that. And I had this video camera on my shoulder stuck in this guy's face. And I recorded his testimony until my battery went dead. It was about an hour. And this man began to share, and he told us his name. His name was Samuel Lamb, L-A-M-B. I never heard of him before, but I've heard of him since. Turned out, he was the most widely known underground church pastor in the West. So in America, or among missiologists and so forth, he was the most widely known underground church pastor in China. Here's what Wikipedia says about him today. He is a leader in the Chinese house church movement known for his resistance against participation in the churches of the state control three self-patriotic movement. He was imprisoned for more than 20 years. You can kind of see how this fits into our story today. 1955 to 57 and 58 to 78 for his faith in Christ. But this imprisonment did not hinder his faith in spite of honey bucket duty, some of you don't know what that is, and labor farms or backbreaking work in coal mines at labor camps, Lamb continued to teach. 1978, Lamb was released from prison 
1979, he restarted the church in Guangzhou because the attendance grew quickly. He then moved the meetings to another address. Now the house church holds four main services each week with an estimated attendance of four to five thousand. And I'm sitting here interviewing this guy. He hands, he has a Bible signed by President Richard Nixon. He has mementos from Colonel James Irwin, the famous Christian astronaut who, after he retired from NASA, spent a lot of years trying to find Noah's Ark in Turkey. When Billy Graham preached in China, uh, just not too long prior to when we were there, this was 89, Billy Graham preached in all three self-patriotic churches except he preached in one underground church. Guess what? in the very room where we were sitting, Billy Graham preached in this man's church. I felt like I was sitting at the feet of Watchman Nee. And to this day, I have that tape, if I could find it. So I'm finishing, and I know we're over time. But today, time is no object, because we got an extra hour today. Verse 23, oh, at, at the end of that meeting and on our way back, I was talking with this leader from the church that had taken us there. And he said in all the years of their movements being involved in carrying Bibles into China, nobody in their group had ever been in an underground church. And he considered it the highlight of his life. And to tell you the truth, pretty much so do I. Verse 27, when they had released them, they went, on, went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth. Remind me sometime to tell you a story about that verse. Can't tell it today. And the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Two questions for us as we close. Are we clear about what our message is about Jesus? And secondly, do we have enough of the Holy Spirit that there's an amazement factor in our lives? And we have the worship team come. Would you all stand with us? We're going to sing um, <clears throat> this song, Hosanna. And if, um, if you forget or never knew what that word means, um, it means it's like a cry out, God, save, save us. And it's also like a praise to God. And so um, in connection with what Ray was sharing, I just, I hope we can cry out to God seeing the world that needs to be saved. God save, God do what only you can do to save. At the same time, this song is about God save us from our numbness, save us from what we often get stuck in. So 
We ask the Holy Spirit to, to bring us alive.
as I was interviewing Pastor Lamb, or actually just recording his the stories he told us to us, he kept telling us about the 20 years and hard labor. And one thing kept coming up time and time again. He kept saying, and they're coming again, and I'm ready. He was more than willing to be arrested again and be taken back into prison for his faith. I believe the disciples in our story were more than willing to take whatever punishment they had coming. In the end, they prayed that the Lord would give them boldness to proclaim the name of Jesus and would do healings and signs and wonders in his name. Somebody asked the other day in teaching pool, well, weren't, wasn't this the same group of people that got baptized in the Holy Spirit at Pentecost? And of course it was. And someone has asked, well, do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again? And someone else has said, well, we're leaky vessels. Sometimes he gets out on us. And we do need. Ephesians 5 tells us we need to be being continually filled with the Holy Spirit. I just want to challenge us today. And here, I don't believe you can have part of the Holy Spirit and not another part. So don't understand what I'm saying in that way. The Holy Spirit is either in you and with you and upon you or he isn't. But we can limit how we allow him to work in our lives by various means. I want to encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to be in you and on you in such a way that the world looks upon you and says, those folks are awesome. They're just awesome. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we need the presence and movement of your Holy Spirit so very desperately in our lives and in our church. And while we don't want strange, fire, and crazy things, we do want fullness of the manifestation of your spirit in whatever way he would choose to make himself known among us because we know that won't be anything but good for us and good for our community thank you father for your precious holy spirit whom you have given to us Amen. anyone's in need of prayer there's a prayer team that would be more than happy to pray with you thank you god god bless you